interested. All right, great. Welcome, everybody. This is Adam Springwater, Senior Client Relations Manager for the HiSET. And some of you have joined before. I'm happy to be with you again today. Um, we're going to spend the next uh, 45 minutes, and it probably isn't going to take that whole time, focusing on the writing essay, the, specifically the essay of the HiSET exam. Now, some of you know from previous webinars that I've done that I, that I have been a teacher for almost 30 years, 29 years now, and really tips and strategies that we're going to talk about today could apply to any writing program that you have and in, in, indeed any any written assessment but what we're going to focus on today is the actual writing subtest of the high set because it is for many sites and states the most failed portion of the of the five uh, subtests and I'm going to give you some tips and strategies today and I'm going to make a big claim at the start and I want you to sharpen your pencils and Attention, and let's see if I can hold true to this claim. But what I claim is that, uh, and none of this is stuff that I made. It's all something that someone else taught me. I did codify and put it together. But the claim I'm going to make is that I'm going to show you some slides and some worksheets that will guarantee that your students write a passing essay the first time and every time. So I know that's a pretty big claim to make, and let's see how we do. So let's get started now. This writing fluency webinar is one part of a three-part series that I that I do. One is called reading comprehension, the other is mathematics mastery. Uh, but today we're going to focus on writing fluency. So it's always good to know what we're talking about when we get started. So let's remind ourselves that the high set is made up of subtests: reading, writing, mathematics, science, and social. Studies. By the way, Rob knows this. Um, I can't read. I'm not reading the chat right now. So, Rob, if something comes up in chat that you think I need to pause for, please interrupt me and let me know. Um, so, the, the high test is five subtests, uh, reading, writing, math, science, and social studies. There is between 50 and 61 questions uh, on the subtest, and all of the questions, except the essay, are single response multiple choice. And today, we're going to focus on that one outlier because of the written subtest, um, if you do not write an essay, you cannot pass it, and you have to write an essay that's a minimum of two out of six possible points. Today, I'm going to show you how to if, uh, some simple instructions on how to get students to write what we call a college and career readiness level essay, four out of six. So all but guarantees that they'll pass that written portion. So I mentioned some scoring. Let's go over this a little bit. There are five subtests. It has between 50 and 61 questions. When they're scored, when the subtest is scored, it is scored on a 20-point rubric. That's a math proportion problem for us. So it's roughly 40% or 8 out of 20 is passing on individual subtest. Now, it's important to note that on the written subtest, there's a couple of uh, qualifications. One is you have to write an essay. You can't pass without writing an essay. And the essay has to score at least two out of the six possible points. So one way to think about the written subtest, is there are 61 questions. The 60 multiple choice questions are worth an aggregate of 14 points, and the essay is worth six. You need at least two out of six to pass, and you must have a combined score of at least eight out of three on that written subtest. Now, I'm gonna show you today, uh, the college and career readiness score is a 15 out of 20, and to workshop is going to be on how to get students to write essays that are a minimum four out of six. So that we're really preparing our students to take those credit bearing courses as they move on with their careers. It's important to have a little bit of background and understand that the high set, like actually every high stakes uh, assessment, high school level and above assessment, we used to do Bloom's taxonomy. Those of us that got our credentials more than 12 years ago, remember Benjamin Bloom's Principles of Mastery Learning, still applicable today, and you'll hear me reference them in my presentations. But assessment is done through Webb's depth of knowledge, and it's important that, that students understand that they not only have to recall information, they have to interpret or apply it, and then in this essay, they have to justify their, 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 uh, their, their what we call their strategic thinking. So, on the entire high set, the vast majority, 78% of the questions are level two uh, interpret, but the essay is very solidly a level three. Call details of the essay, recall of the, of the prompts, call details of the personal life, apply that, interpret it, and then justify your, your, your decisions. It's a persuasive essay. So let's take a look at this. I dive right in, and as uh, my wife and I are both avid, as we like to say, we're gonna get our hands and our feet wet. 
So hopefully you're going to have, you know, my goal is that in about a half an hour, you feel that you have some solid nuggets that are going to make a difference for you and your program and really you prepare your students to take and pass this written subtest the first time and every time. So one of the most important places to start with the high set is a document called the test at a glance. Now I'll provide you the link here, but you can Google high set test at a glance. And this document answers the three main questions that everyone's asking. And it does it for all five subtests. So it'll tell you the test, the content categories. It'll tell you how to assess the process categories. And it tells you why it's assessed. It lists the career and college readiness indicators. So if you look at this written subtest, you see that language facility is by far important in the categories that you're going to be scored on. And you can see that the essay question has development of central position or claim, organization of ideas, language facility, and writing convention. I'm going to take a look at the specific scoring rubrics that apply to the essay. But more importantly, and I'll tell you now because I don't believe in false suspense, the little secret, the thing that I discovered and worked with colleagues to work develop is that the answer to all of these questions that they're looking for in the scoring rubric is literally in the instructions that accompany the high set written portion. So your task, your your mission, if should you choose good morning, Mr. Phelps. Some of you older TV watchers will recognize mission impossible. Your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to really get your students and yourself to read the instructions carefully. Because although it's written at a higher level, you do have to decode it for students. The actual instructions tell you literally exactly how to write a passing essay. So let's remember that we've got these levels of DOK, depth, uh, depth of knowledge, and although we have level three justify, uh, the essay also includes some level four, which is extended thinking, because we're, we're shooting for a current college readiness indicator. So I want my students to use complex reasoning and synthesize information. And I'm going to exactly how the instructions that are printed on every high set test show you exactly how to do that. So one of the things in adult education it's important to remember is that adults learn for fundamentally different reasons than regular high school students. Um, they want to have access to information so that they can orient themselves to a world they are already navigating. Most students live in a world that is by high school activities. Most adult students live in a world that are dominated by world activities like job requirements, court requirements, family, family of their own, their own children, dependent requirements that make their motivation for learning much, much different. Uh, high school students in general project themselves into a world that they imagine themselves in and have a, have a, a, a sort of a, a, well, we try to give them a sense of the future. Adult ed students are living in that world and are trying to orient themselves in a world that's already making, navigate a world that's already making demands on them. Adults also learn because they want to be taken seriously. They want to express ideas and be uh, be taken seriously and taken into account. Um, any, we've all seen that adult ed parent whose child has to translate for them or who relies on someone else to read a menu for them in a restaurant. Um, and we all, at uh, Every one of us wants to be, to be taken into account, but for adult education, adult education programs, it's to keep that in mind. And we're going to talk about how the essay helps do all of these things for our students. We're going to draw four of these motivations because, you know, engagement is really all about motivation. And motivation is about connecting students in their own experience to what the, what the tasks at hand are. And action, making decisions, and of course, bridging is an interesting thing. This, this is what I feel that we educators actually bring to the table. Um, so the average high school student has about 184, 85 days, depending on your district, uh, seven and a quarter hours a day, over four years to master what the adult does on average between six and eight days while they work a full-time job, while they handle life responsibilities, while they take care of kids, while they take care of their health issues, while they deal with court issues or, you know, uh, other, other drug substance abuse, all of those adult issues that they're dealing with. And so what we want to do bridging is it's a polite form. It's not always asked lightly of why do I need to know this? So I feel that our job is to not only, you know, like so if you're doing teaching reading comprehension, I always use science and social studies paragraphs because why not double dip? It's the same comprehension and they're going to have to be familiar with that form of reading anyway. Um, in the writing, we're going to show you how you can connect 
what their life, daily life experiences, which are valuable, will help them write a better essay. So let's jump in. All right, roll up your sleeves and let's get started. We're going to this is going to be these are the slides. I'm going to show you exactly how to do it. So the content category essay question. Here's how it works, and each uh, content category descriptor has a CCR standard that it's tied to. So if you look at them, there's four of them: a development of central position of claim, organization ideas, language facility, and writing conventions. Now, I guarantee you, for your students, and even for you, certainly for me, the first time I read this, in my brain it sounded a little bit like the parents on Peanuts. Remember the Peanuts cartoon, and the parents would talk. It was always whoa, 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 whoa. This is a big, this is these are tough words, big words, which they call kelps in, in ESL and transitional programs. These are challenging ideas, but break it down and make it accessible. If we bridge it, if we do that bridging thing, we'll show our students how with instructions, they will give, give them the, uh, the answer. So really, what we're talking about is unpacking the essay. Instead of doing ready, fire, aim, which a lot of people, a lot of my students used to do, they would just kind of regurgitate something and then go back in and try to fix it later or not and just hope it worked. What we're going to do is take a breather, so my goal is that this is an example of how to take, so it's 120 minutes for the written subtest. I want to set up a situation where my students are taking 15, no more than 20 minutes on writing the essay. Get it done first. As uh, Mark Twain famously said once, he said a lot of famous things, but one time he said, if you have to eat two frogs, eat the big one first. So the written subtest is like eating two frogs for most, they don't look fun. And the essay is by far the most intimidating. So let's get that done, get it out of the way, write the essay, and let's not take the whole two hours. Let's teach, let's teach our students how to do it in about 15, I'm gonna show you 10 sentences. Take about 15 or maybe 20 minutes, get it done and move on to the rest of the multiple choice. So reading the directions is the key to unlocking this little puzzle and forcing people to slow down and showing them why it's important to read the directions. And by reading the directions, I mean spend just two or three minutes looking over the directions, and we'll show you, I'll break it down exactly in some future slides. Then read the stimulus passages, which are the prompts. It's always a persuasive essay. There's always two positions that are presented. You take one side or the other, and you argue them effectively. And once you've read the directions, taken two or three minutes to do that, read the stimulus passages, taken two or three minutes to do that, begin the writing task. And if you do it sequentially in this order, you'll find it's the best use of your time for the student. So let's take a look at the directions. Now, these are the actual directions that are written on the high set subtest for the written thing. And it, you'll see it correlates directly to the scoring guide. And a couple of slides, I'm gonna provide you with some links to the actual scoring rubrics, which don't appear on the test, but them in the class, you can use them in the class to demonstrate, because students, that's that bridging thing. Know, well, why to know this? Well, let me show you. If you read the instructions carefully, you will be addressing these exact things that you're going to be scored on. And if you do that, you get a four out of six and you get a CCR score on your essay. And you can move on to the rest of the test. Let's take a look. It says development of a central position through explanation of supporting reasons, examples, and details from passages and personal experience. And then organization, clear organization of ideas, including an introduction. Conclusion, logical paragraphs, and effective transitions. And language and grammar is language use. Include varied word choice, varied sentence construction, and appropriate voice. And then grammar and usage is clarity and correctness of writing conventions. So we're gonna, so here's the answers, folks. It's not a secret. So if you look at this first one, content, you have to develop a central position. Well, this is where we translate. What does that mean? That means you, you give an opinion. Clearly and succinctly, you state it clearly. This is an essay about whether or not there should be dress codes at school. I think there should be dress codes. That is a central position. Then it says supporting reasons. There's an S. So you give two reasons. I think there should be dress codes, and you can give your two reasons, you know, whatever the reasons are. And then it says examples. There's an S there. Then you give two examples for each of your reasons. And don't forget to use details from the passages and personal experience. So I'm going to give you a worksheet at the end here that lays this all out literally for students. But you can read these instructions. It says topic sentence, state the topic, what's this about, take a position, give your first, give your two reasons. Next paragraph, take your first reason and give an example 
with a detail from the passage and a personal experience. Then third, take your second reason. And again, give an example and details from the passages and personal experience. That right there is a two out of six essay. If you do that, this is an essay about whether or not there should be uh, lunch served at public schools. These are different topics that come up on the high set and all these persuasive arguments. That Adam, Adam, I just students should be able to wanted to point yeah. out you are cutting out a little bit. Uh, I know you're having trouble with the sound, so um, maybe a little closer what to the you phone. What do you want me to do? Hey, I, I will put the phone right up underneath me. I haven't moved. How is this? Is this any better? Yes. Okay. Uh, very frustrating, folks, because I'm not moving at all. I'm actually keeping so very still. All right, uh, Rob, thank you for that. Um, so let's. So we've got a two out of six based on the content alone. <clears throat> let's take a look at organization, and this will be the complete four out of six score. It says clear organization ideas, including an introduction and a conclusion and logical paragraphs. So you have to have an introduction. What's this? Essay? about state the topic the easiest way to do that is just re restate the top whatever the title is of the actual is an essay about uh, dress code you'll see it it's always printed the 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 prompts or the stimulus passages always come with a sentence that can just be simplified and made into your topic sentence uh, and then make sure that you have a conclusion and the conclusion we're going to learn if we want to bump from a two to a four or from a past career hardness is where you address the other side. Uh, and then the conclusion can also where you restate your topic. So there is your five paragraphs. Introduction, take a, state the topic, take a position, give two examples. Second paragraph, take one of your examples, and it's written right here in the content. Give an example with a detail from the passage and from personal experience. Take your second reason why this should happen and give a detail from the passage and personal experience. And then this organization will tell you the other side with a conclusion there's other people disagree with me and there i'm going to show you another place where they're reminded to do in the instructions and then a conclusion basically restate this paragraph now another thing to pay attention to for scoring is language grammar grammar and usage so very word choice and varied sentence constructions and appropriate voice so we're going to talk about this this is an essay this is not a text message to your friend meeting you at the movie you don't use things like lol God forbid, WTF. You, you don't use abbreviations or, or, or uh, you know, idiomatic speaking. You speak very clearly. This is a this is a formal essay. Vary your word choice. Keep keep. Uh, and I'm going to show you show students how to do. Most students write very simple sentences, repetitive sentence sentence structures. So we're going to show you how to show students to take those simple sentences and use this magic word called a conjunction to combine them and appropriate them. Uh, and, and vary their structures. And the last thing, clarity and correctness. This is one of my favorite dirty little secrets. Um, I am a personally, a, I am challenged speller. My wife is a perfect speller. I'm challenged with spelling. But I always like to say, those of us that are poor spellers have rich vocabulary, because we had to look at other words that, that you know, we, we can't spell one word, we think of three or four words that we can spell that mean about the same thing. But here's an important thing about the high set scoring. You, you are people for lack of clarity. I'm sure you've all seen this. A student doesn't know how to spell a word, so they just spell it three or four different ways in the paragraph and hope that one of them is right. It causes confusion for the reader. So when you come to spelling conventions, if you know how to spell the word, go for it. If you're not sure, use the best phonetic approximation that you can. Use that same spelling all the way through. So if the word is phone and you're not sure if it's P-H-O-N-E or F-O-N-E, spell it how you think it should be spelled, F-O-N-E, and then use it consistently through the whole paragraph and you'll avoid confusion. And writing conventions, this is a simple one. It's, it's your basic middle school. It's, I taught a lot of fifth and sixth grade. Every sentence starts with a capital and every sentence ends with punctuation. If you're not sure, just put a period. We don't have to get clever with exclamation points or questions. So every sentence starts with a capital, every sentence starts with a period. Do those simple things, you will be guaranteed to write a passing, if not a four out of six essay. And these slides are provided to you, and I provided, here's a copy of this is what it actually looks like on the test. So you can show your students, there it is, there's all these words. So you've worked in class, you've decompressed what all these things mean. You can see there it is, all of, the, and I'll just go back to the previous slide, all of this 
is right here on this page. So we're going to train our students how to read the instructions and understand that they're telling us exactly how to write a passing essay. And then we're going to show them that, yeah, there it is on every test you'll take of the high set. It'll be right there in the instructions. Wait, there is more, more help coming to you. So if you see, here is un another unpacking the essay. So we're going to look at the direct end. And here we see below, hold on, below you will find two paths which the authors put forth different perspectives on, the, on an issue of importance. Read passages carefully, noting strengths and weaknesses of each discussion, then you will write an essay in which you explain your own opinion on the issue. So here is where your topic sentence comes from. You can say, well, they say basically read the paragraph, the paragraphs carefully and state a position. So the following articles about casual dress codes at work were columnists of a business magazine that appeared side by side in a recent issue. So what's this about? This is an essay about dress codes at work. Period. That's it. You've got your sentence. You've introduced the topic strongly and clearly. One of the number one reasons why students do not pass the essay is because they start writing their opinion without saying what it's about. They're unclear about that. So if you restate the, this, the, some, the, the main topic here in this sentence, you will, you will, you will be writing a, a passing essay. Furthermore, they give more experience, and now they're going to break it down. So we've got the directions. We've got more directions. So now you write an essay in which you explain your own position on the issue of whether or not businesses should allow employees to wear casual clothing in the workplace. This is an essay about whether or not businesses should allow casual clothing in the workplace. I think they should. Boom, you've nailed off the two big things. You've taken a position, you've stated the topic and taken a position. And now the instructions are going to remind you again, be sure to use specific reasons with an S. I always tell them S means more than one, so use two reasons examples with an S, two examples from your own experience and knowledge to support your position. So a lot of times the mistake students make is they only quote what's written in the essay. They don't state their own position. Now we're going to talk about this because most of my students, well, all of us suffer from self-esteem issues and a lot of students in adult ed programs suffer not necessarily from self-esteem issues, but certainly from expressing themselves in writing. And so there's some specific tips and strategies. I'm going to give you some worksheets that show you exactly how to develop daily familiarity, a daily practice in writing and validating their personal experiences. So when it comes time to write an essay, they can say, oh yeah, I remember this is a dress code. That has to do with when I got a job and I had to wear that waitress uniform or I was working in the auto shop and I wore blue or I went to the courthouse and recognized who the judge, you know, that, that will have familiarity with, with personal experience. And here, where it really the instructions give them that push level two or passing to a level four current college readiness. It'll say, remember that every position exists within the context of a larger discussion of the issue. So your essay should at minimum, minimum acknowledge alternate and or opposing ideas. Well, that's a reminder that after you've taken your first paragraph to state your topic and position, and after you've taken your second paragraph to take your first re and give your two reasons, and then you've taken your second paragraph and you've stated your first reason with personal experience as well as from the essay, and your third paragraph where you've taken your other reason and supported it with an example from personal experience and from one of the two essays, in your fourth paragraph, you're going to acknowledge the alternate or opposing ideas. Some people disagree with me. They think there should, be, there should not be dress codes. All you have to do is acknowledge it. You don't have to validate or justify it. And that reminds people to put that in there. And then the fifth paragraph is just to restate the first paragraph. So I'm not trying to make light of this. What, I, what we're asking students to do is to decode challenging language. Instructions are not immediately decodable as having the answer. But I hope you'll agree that as we sift around a little bit with it, we spend some time in class working with students, we can show them that here it is specifically how to do it. So let's recap a little bit. And this is some, you, I hope you notice that these slides are designed for you to share with your students. So this would be a good share a slide to share. So you get two passages describing opposing views on the topic. You take your position and support it with evidence from the text and your own experience. Don't skip that. And we always want to know what the scores are. And so I'm preparing you to write a four out of six or higher. The main difference between a two and a four, and this is in order, formal tone facility, organization, development, counterclaim, and selective use of evidence. So that counterclaim 
has already been pointed out to you. So if you read the directions carefully, you're minded to, to, to address the other side. So you're already going to bump your essay up. But let's take a look. So another slide for your students. Make sure you take a position. Make sure you support it with evidence from your own experience. Acknowledge the counterclaim, and don't forget to vary your word choice and sentence structure. Now, yeah, that's easier said than done, isn't it? Well, let's show some specific strategies on how to do it. But before we do that, we're going to look at the scoring rubric. Now, what I just did here is bad. This is way too much information on one slide. So I just want you to see the overall slide. You can share it with your students. We're going to look at content, organization, and language and grammar. But now we're going to break down each of these. Now, I focus on two and four because a zero and one is failing. I'm explaining you how to fail. A three is middle ground. I'm really interested in a three. And a five or six, if you score better than a four, more power to you. But what I'm really interested in the targeting is make sure you understand what passing is and make sure you understand what uh, current readiness is. This, this is striving for perfection. As uh, Vince Lombardi famously said once, uh, perfection is not attainable, but if you strive for it, you'll reach excellence every time. So I'm going to strive for the four or the five or six and hopefully get the excellence of at least the score of a four, but definitely. A so let's break it down because We've made some big claims, you read the instructions, you do these things, but let's look at how it's actually going to be scored. Now, this information is not on the test, but I find that it helps strengthen students' resolve that we do know what we're talking about. So if you look, a two is if the topic is somewhat correct or understandable. So if you just basically ballpark the topic, you're going to do fine. But if the context of topic is provided for discussion, including some discussion of the alternate claims or counterclaims, that's a four. So that's why I tell them, that little piece of instruction where it says address counterclaim is telling you how to write for. And the writer's own position on the issue of claims is clear. So it's several, meaning more than one, ideas of adequate explanation provide and some specific and relevant examples or details. So it's not a high bar. You just have to check all the boxes to do it. And remember, all of this was laid out in the instructions, but now I'm showing you how the scoring rubric backs it up. Now, the organization, really the main thing is a clear functional introduction conclusion or purpose. You can be a little bit more in the middle, but five paragraphs. First one, topic, position, two, two reasons. Second paragraph, first reason, two examples. Third paragraph, other reason uh, with, two, with personal example and one from the paragraph. Fourth paragraph, that critical fourth paragraph where you address the counterclaims and then lastly, a conclusion. This is what I, and I always have the same conclusion. I say, in conclusion, I believe that there should restate your topic and your position. And the great way to end every essay is invite the reader to consider. This is why I think there should be dress codes in the workplace. What do you think? And leave it like that. It's a great way to really push a level, an, an essay up into the floor. This is my favorite slide to look at because people worry a lot about language and grammar, but there's really just a few potholes or landmines that you have to avoid. First off, it's as skill of language is, is used to demonstrate it. If you notice, I'm focusing on the four. The two is there, and we can certainly talk about it, but it's important to teach, you know, like I said, the Vince Lombardi, we're striving for excellence so that we get, I mean, for perfect so we can get excellence, and I consider four, any four or higher. So word choice is mostly somewhat varied. We're going to take a look at some slides that help students with varied word, so, word choice. Um, control of sentences with some variety of length and structure. We're going to work on that magic called conjunction. Uh, we can get our students to write a series of simple subject verb, subject verb, or you know, now subject predicate, noun verb sentences, and then we'll use some magic words called conjunctions to put them together and create complex uh, sentences. Um, a formal style establish objective tone. That means we take this seriously. We talk like we're talking to a or to your grandmother, you know, so some form. I try to give examples my students can relate to. Uh, you know, you're not hanging out with your friends on the schoolyard. Uh, and adequate command of English grammar and usage, that's simple. Every sentence starts with a capital. Every sentence ends with a period. And then punctuation and spelling appear, but they don't interfere with understanding. I always like to point out that that means if you're not sure how to spell a word, spell it so that someone sounding out the letters could make sense of what you're saying, and don't mix that. So I made some big claims. 
about 15 minutes left. I'm going to show you some worksheets. I've got five different strategies that work here, and then we're going to round up with the actual worksheet itself. Then I'm going to provide you with a bunch of links that, that back up some of these resources that we've shown through. But all of these worksheets are welcome to use. So we talked about how they have to write about personal experiences. If you don't write about a personal experience, you will, you're will you very much in danger of not passing the essay. It's, it's this, so the biggest reason that students don't pass the essay is they don't state the topic clearly and take a position clearly. The other one is that they don't get personal experience. They're just wholesale copy from the... I've seen this, it says, a student panic, and he just basically recopies the essays, one of the essays he read. That will not pass. You have to include some personal experience. So you gotta give students practice writing about personal experience. Most of my students, practice, well, not all of them, but most of them practice talking about personal experience. They certainly could write things in a sort of a movie, Snapchat-y kind of Twitter kind of way, but they needed to be able to write an essay. This is a formal writing example. So you do, and I believe in daily practice, daily journal practice. You should do daily practice in mathematics and daily practice in writing. So, what? So you have an example of something, a personal experience, something that's happened that that could be common. Like, have you ever made a meal? And then you talk about three areas. Well, what I have I ever read about someone making a meal? Have I ever seen someone making a meal? Have I ever been where someone's made a meal? And now, for some of my students, especially little, read, how about heard about, seen a movie? I mean, I'm very with, with what I mean by reading, but and you just get simple, it's like a quick write. You put something up on the board and everyone gets out their journal and they spend three minutes writing sentences and then people get up and share them. And if someone shares an experience that you or was similar to you, you're, you're more than welcome to copy it down. And what happens is if you do this every day over a period of time, they build, first off, they build a habit of having confidence about writing and talking about their personal experiences. And they get a habit of listening to other experiences, not feeling so isolated and alone, because quite frankly, on the test, when you give a reason, it doesn't have to be yours. So the daily quick write is a great write to do that. And then you can streamline it even more by having an end target in mind. So for instance, that essay that we just looked at, that example, I know that the practice test I'm going to give them has an essay on dress codes, on whether or not they should be in the workplace. So my daily quick write from two weeks before might be, um, how did you choose? How do you choose your clothes today to go to school uh, or to go to work? It was there a difference? And then the next day might be. So some people lay their clothes out. Some people grab them from the. <laughs> some people grab them from the dirty laundry hamper and pick the least clean, the, the, the most clean one. Some people fold their lawn. Some people have their parents give them clothing. Some people uh, have it hanging in the closet. There's all these different ways that people choose how to get dressed in, in the morning for work or, or for school. And you could just do quick writes on that. The next day, I might have something up there that says, what's the difference between the way you dress for school and the way you dress for work? And the day after that, must be, what's, what's the most fancy dress or formal dress you ever wear? You get a lot of people dressing for church or for funerals or for different experiences that they have. Uh, what's the most casual place you dress and how does it look? bathing suits and bikinis at uh, the beach, or if they don't have a beach, you know, whatever their experience is. Uh, do you ever wear a uniform? Uh, where do you wear uniforms, sports? And you just kind of tease these questions out and you can really develop them based on your, they're going to be, you know, you're going to know your students and I do. I used to try to pick questions that I knew my students, I was pitching softball to them, nice, easy lobbing things that I knew that they would engage in an answer. And we do these quick writes and then we share them and you could copy each other's essays. So if you didn't write something, then you had to copy what someone else wrote. So you're building that fluent, fluency. And then in two weeks, when they go to write the essay on dress codes, now they have a whole body of examples that they can give to their reasons. Well, I think there should be a dress code because it helps you identify uh, the official people in charge. For instance, when I play soccer, I wear a blue uniform so that I know who the players are on my team. In the heat of the game, I pass the ball to the wrong person. You can also get what's called a wall or you put it in a journal, and we're going to take a better look at that. Um, but so you've got that. So another strategy that helps developing essay writing skills are, the truth is, most students in our program, because they're not really good at organizing thoughts, bright, very hardworking, very competent people, is either reading, there's some issue with organizing thoughts. So none of us are born well with with thoughts that are well organized all of us have to learn how to do it almost always 
education theory is through imitation. So let's give our students the same advantage with writing. So now I want to make a caveat. The best writing frame, some of you know what writing frames are. It says you just plug in, there's the places, and you can Google writing frame, argument of writing frame. You'll come up with a thousand of these worksheets. This one comes from the Literacy Assistance Center. It also, the majority of them are written for third, fourth, or fifth grade writing programs. This one used to say fourth grade on it. You'll notice I clipped that off it. It was actually on the top and put a frame around it because I don't need to remind my students that they're writing at a fourth grade level because they already know it and I believe in respecting adults. This is uh, one of those four principles, uh, empowering our adults without humiliating them. So you can find a lot of writing frames, especially argumentative or persuasive writing frames, literally in middle school books. And in this case, you can take this writing frame and all those sentences that they've been writing for two weeks and just have them plug them in the first time. So there's a lot of discussion about whether or not there should be a dress code. People who support dress code claim that blank. And you can see you can use these writing frames to help build a formal form of writing. So now we get to that varied sentence structure and creating a more mature uh, uh, writing fluency that would, that's one of the, the highest scores, the, the writing facility. So magic words conjunctions that help people join sentences. And again, I hope you see that I'm building a sequential set of activities here where those simple oral attestations about the topic, then transfer that into simple sentences. Now we're taking those simple sentences, we're plugging them into writing frames so we have a sense of organization. But we can take our simple sentences and combine them using conjunctions. Now these are sequencing conjunctions that are critical for writing the essay. And you can see that if you practice them, we put them on a word wall, we have students write them, plug it in. Well, first of all, I'd like to state that this is an essay about dress codes. Second of all, I mean, you can do it finally. These are critical words that help students join sentences together and avoid that machine gun repetitive sentence structure that although Ernest was very good at it, most people not, that repetitive thing. So this sentence structure, and this pushes a writing piece of writing from a two to a four. Well, there's a lot of conjunctions, and this is actually a word wall that I had in one of my classrooms, and we would add to it on a daily basis. Now, I had the privilege of working in the same room every day. Not all of us do that. Um, so you could do this in a journal format. If you're doing a Zoom class, you could have students save it to their desktop. If you're in class and you have butcher block paper or blackboard, you could certainly do that. But I'm a big fan of students having their own journals. But there are a lot of transitional conjunctions that will help a student move their work from that to, to a more mature and a more formally organized thing. So and comparing, effect, contrasting, qualifying, sequencing, illustrating, emphasizing. And these are all, you can see that plug into those five paragraphs. That fourth paragraph where you have to address the other side, all those contrasting conjunctions will help. On the other hand, comma, strange as it may seem, comma, no, I mean, you can have fun with it, but it's a way to, to, to bring people's writing up to the next level and aim for that four out of six instead of a two out of six. Well, we're coming to the end here, and I've tried to move uh, with clarity. I hope that my, my speed microphone was working well. This is, this is the, the golden nugget right here, and this is the template that we've been talking out for the last 40 minutes. So this lays it out very simply. Now you're welcome to modify it. I use this, this is the kind of language that I use with students and I found it to be successful. It is a little complex. I've had some, a lot of ESL and ELL work and I had a couple of my colleagues want to simplify the language. You're welcome to do that, but it's got the nuggets here of writing a five paragraph essay. And by the way, they just have to write about if a sentence student is not sure about how to separate paragraphs, then they just write one long 10 sentence paragraph and they'll at least do it. They might even get a four because the paragraphing is only, uh, you'll only get graded down for, for lack of paragraphing if, if clarity is, is not is an issue. So if you can write clearly in one paragraph, you, you can do that. But let's get it straight. This is about 10 or maybe 15 sentences. So in your first paragraph, introduction, what does that mean? Well, what is the topic? And we've already showed our students how to go to the heading of the essay. The topic is right there. So make them, tell us what the topic is and make a claim. That's your position. Give two reasons. Very simple. That's That can be one sentence in the first paragraph. This is an essay about whether or not there should be dress codes. There should be dress 
because it lets you identify who's doing what in a workforce, and it makes you feel more professional. A little bit of a run. Most of my students wouldn't write like that. Most of them would break that down. This is an essay about uh, workforce, uh, about dress codes in the work period. I think there should be dress codes in the workforce, and now I'm going to use one of those magic conjunctions because blank. blank. Second, take your first reason to give evidence from the text and personal experience, one of each. Third paragraph, you take your second reason, again, give evidence from the text and from personal experience. From the text is from those prompts that you took two or three minutes to read carefully. Now, the magic paragraph, I like calling it paragraph because it pushes your score from a two to a four. Don't forget it, the counterclaim. On the other hand, conversely, some people disagree, and then you can give the reason, and you can give it the text of personal experience if you choose to. And to wrap it all up and bring it home, you write a conclusion, which is just a restate of the topic and the claim. You don't have to give your reasons and always invite the reader to consider it. So, Rob, I have about four minutes left here. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to show everybody. At this point, I'm going to invite all of you to – let me check chat. Uh, oh, I love – thank you for the positive feedback I'm reading through now. Christine has given me some good comments. Um, I haven't, what I'm going to show you is that when you get the deck, you will also be getting um, resources with links for those scoring rubrics. Whoops. I accidentally clicked on the link. You probably don't see that anymore. My screen shares that. <laughs> what happens when you click on the screen? Um, here is an example of the test at a glance that what the test, how it's assessed, and the current college readiness codes, prep, webinar links, resources assessing readiness links, uh, guides, and a variety of resources, things for the students as well, the test taker bulletin and things like that. So that's my presentation for today. At this point, I invite any or all of you to ask questions. I have a couple of more minutes. I have a hard stop at quarter to the hour, so I have a couple of minutes for questions or comments at this time. Hey, Adam, it's Brandy Logan, and I just wanted to ask hey, Brandy. you, how are you? Um, can we get the I'm slide good. deck at attached to the link for the presentation so that way anyone can go back and find that slide deck? Absolutely. And Rob is going to take care of that. I think he was, I specifically asked Rob to wait until after I was done presenting because it's kind of like if you pass out the beforehand, the students just read them. They don't pay attention to you. But Wonderful. Rob is going to take care of that. And no, Randy, for some it. reason you don't get it, you can just email me directly and I'm happy to share them with you. Fantastic. And I think um, as a former reading writing uh, instructor in the classroom, um, what is the essay format? Are we looking at a five basic paragraph essay format or does that link yeah. take off um, uh, points? Yeah, so I'll show you. Uh, I have to click. It's going to be hold on. Let me. Let do this the hard way. I'm going to, I'm a man talking, doing two things at once is not my forte. All right. Are you seeing the slide where yes, I Yes, I see that the, now. Uh, Thank you. Okay. So this is the critical slide, Brandy. And Brandy, this is the goal. This is the nugget. Everything I talked about is explaining how to give students, show students that all of these are in the instructions. That's really the takeaway is we train our students to know that the instructions they're right there in front of you. Don't panic. Relax. You got this. I'm going to show you how to read instructions. I'm going to show you how to break it down. But this is the essay to write. It's five paragraphs, one or two, or maybe three sentences. It's 10 or 15 sentences. Get it done in 15 minutes. Move on to the rest of the essay. One of the tragedies, I've seen this happen, where a student freezes up, and Brandy, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about, and then they have two hours, and they spend an hour trying to write an essay and they they're just fried by the time they get to the rest of the test so we want to avoid that absolutely yeah just teaching basic test writing skills or uh, test skills is a really helpful tool with any type of uh, equivalency like this and then also um, the contrast and comparison you know I was always a teacher that geared towards AccuPlacer ready and so when we were teaching for AccuPlacer then you know the writing came coincided with it because those skills coincided with AccuPlacer. So right, right. with our minimum of a two points, you know, would you say that a six point perfect score equivalency, what type of skills range would that be? 
the first thing I want to say, Brandy, is I've never seen anyone get higher than a four. There, I don't see fives and sixes. Adult ed students tend not to write them, so that's one. Um, and then key placement things. You know, what, what you're really looking at, it, it's, I think, Brandy, to just go with the, with the scoring rubric that I outlined on the slides that goes specifically with the high set. Um, because you can you can get correlations and approximations, but my opinion, I'm not trying to avoid your question, is that it builds confidence for the student if they know that I've prepared them based on the rubric that they're actually scored on, not another rubric, another Accuplacer scoring rubric. If Accuplacer says they're ready, they're ready, but I like to drill into the high set rubric itself. Now, I have some good news and bad news for you. Which one do you want first? <laughs> Go ahead and hit the group with what you got. The, the bad news is I have to go. Uh, I have a hard stop and I'm 30 seconds past it. The good news is if any of you email me, I'm happy to follow up with the, with the questions. And if Rob or Christine could put email in the chat, with that, I'm going to have to I apologize, but this is a hard stop for me. Uh, so I really thank you for your time. And I hope the nugget thank out you, of here was useful. Thank you so much, Adam. If anyone wants to stay on and yeah. ask a couple of questions, Christine from Atlas is here, as well as myself from MDE. We've been doing a lot of um, data research and just looking deep diving into the high set. I want to say Christine has a whole lot more on me. <laughs> Not on the high set, I don't. <laughs> but so, um, are you pay attention to the chat box. Those are coming up. Everything's in the calendar. You can register. We're really excited for all the, the webinars we have coming up, both those with Adam and Tanya, uh, the deep dive, and also the ones that are going to be a little more casual, where uh, Lindsay and I and Brandy are going to be facilitating just some conversation about experience taking the official practice tests and just gaining information like what do you as teachers see as similarities and differences and just a chance for us to come together. Definitely. We just want everyone to get the information out there to have the ability to take a look at all of the sections of the high set. We have a lot of people asking specifically about the writing because we know as educators that students don't have to complete the GED writing portion and they can still pass. So it is different that there has to be a minimum of a two score for a passing for the high set. For me as an educator, personally, I think that's phenomenal because it enforces writing skills. And if we are gearing our students of high school equivalency towards Accuplacer and CCRS, then this just goes right along with it because we're teaching writing skills in the classroom. Not only that, but as many of you are hearing and are going to hear ad nauseum as I can, you know, continue working on my doctoral program with writing, writing is essential. It's essential to thinking. It's essential to deepening comprehension of text. Um, it's just, it's essential for understanding audience. It's just, I agree, Brandy is right. It's exciting. It may not feel exciting, but we are definitely going to be upping the PD uh, for writing instruction. I um, mean, personally, a lot with working with dual enrolled students back in Georgia through Ability to Benefit, I saw more students bypass developmental courses in reading and writing when they got to the college level, when we emphasize their writing more in the classroom. And reading and writing are, are linked in so many ways. Absolutely. Does that's anyone have any questions or anything? I know it's been a long two days. You can always reach out to me at MDE and I'll put my email in the chat as well. And I know y'all know how to get a hold of Christine at Atlas. And we look forward to having everyone come to our webinars. Um, Atlas is putting out, uh, Christine, you put those out there in the chat, I believe, the dates. Yep. yep. So uh, 914, we've got the math and science. And then on 919 is going to be that social studies reading and writing. And then we're going to have some deep dives in October, one per week. And that's where we're really going to get the opportunity. So if you haven't reached out to your consortium manager and you haven't gotten those vouchers to take the official practice test, every ABE funded program within the state of Minnesota is eligible for those, every instructor, any type of administration position. So if that's something that you would like to take the time and take one or all five, reach out to your consortium manager, find out how to get those vouchers and we can get them to you.
And remember, if you can't find Brandy's email, and a lot of you, it's very easy on the Atlas site, um, go ahead and email me because I will likely send it on to Brandy. Um, <laughs> so um, just as a reminder, we're so excited to have Brandy. She is going to be focused. We've got, you know, somebody who is really going to be working with this high school uh, equivalency, the pathways and um, the uh, implementation. And um, it's so great to have somebody in that position. Thanks so much. And just a little insight, guys. I'm a high school dropout with a GED. So going into this is something real personable for me because I understand the need of my math skills and my writing skills and wanting to take that high school equivalency and move past just an equivalency and diploma. I wanted to go to college. So this is something that is near and dear to my heart. Yeah, Laura, I'm going to let Brandy answer that question. That's something I know that there that the pop that policy is something that Brandy is working on. So, Brandy, if you want to say any more about accessing and giving the paper version. Yes. Yeah, so we are working um, on the paper policy currently right now. What we are going to um, allowances for Minnesota. It has not been set in stone because high sets not available currently. Again, if you have any information, we have sent out communication for certain testing sites to be part of a pilot. So we are going to um, select 10 to 15 sites and they are going to pilot high set testing centers between October to December. And we're just gonna have a lot of great data to collect on the do's and don'ts and how the process worked. Some of those are gonna be DOC sites um, within the prisons as well. So we're going to be able to get a lot of information on all of our populations of student. And then the goal is, is towards January, we're going to start opening up more testing sites because we've learned the process a whole lot faster um, and just a better process. And then more students will have the availability to take the high set or their GED if they choose, because the goal is, is options for our ABE students here in Minnesota. Um, so the paper policy will come out before October, and that will be um, put into our, not only on our website, but then the high set website will have state requirements and you'll be able to find those in multiple locations. And I know Atlas will also place those on the resource page which we're going to be working on in Tuesday. the resource library. <laughs> yes, Brandy is going to be directing me um, on what to get up there so that you have a one-stop shop. Very exciting. I'm super excited to be here. So Georgia girl plan, uh, transplant into Minnesota. <laughs> Hopefully my Southern draw is not too much for you guys. All right. Well, if that's going to be it, everyone have a